Thessalonians chapter number 2. I want to thank you so much, Pastor Mansour, for the opportunity to preach this morning. It's a great privilege. Uh, as he mentioned, my name is Levi Tyrrell, and my wife here is Aloma. Uh, we serve at Bible Baptist Church in St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada. So we're not too far from Toronto. It's probably the biggest city close to us. Uh, but, but it is a privilege. It's an honor to be here, and I'm very thankful for the opportunity to preach this morning. I do want to thank Jeremy again for the chance to be at Epic Camp last weekend. We did have a great weekend. And um, I, I threatened the teenagers. I told them. We, I taught them some silly campfire songs. We love camp ministry back in Canada. It's a big part of our story and our testimony. Uh, I got saved at camp. I, I surrendered my life to preach at camp. And so camp ministry is very important to me. And so I taught the teenagers some of my favorite camp songs. And they're, they're, they got lots of actions and they're embarrassing. And I told them, if they don't listen, I'm going to call them up here this morning. I'm going to line them up here and make them do it. I won't do it this morning, but parents, if you have teenagers, I want you to go home and ask them to show you the song, Making Melodies, all right? They'll know what it is. They're going to teach it to you. So I encourage you to do that. But no, I, I do. we did have a great weekend at Epic Camp. And church, I want to encourage you this. A lot of times, decisions that are made at camp can stay at camp. And so if you are parents of teenagers, or if you know teenagers in the church, I want to encourage you to challenge them and encourage them to be faithful to the decisions that they've made, to be faithful to what God's done in their lives, not to leave uh, the challenge and the decisions that were made at camp at camp, but to come home and to continue to live for Christ. And, and, uh, and so I just want to encourage you with that church family. I'd like to ask you a question. We're going to get to our text in just a few moments, but I'd like to ask you a question this morning as we begin. How many of you would call yourself an extrovert? You're an extroverted people type of a person. Raise your hand. How many of you are like that? An extrovert. Uh, my hand is raised. Not many of us. How many of you are more introverted? Oh, lots more introverts. My wife is right there with you. You know, it's good, to, it's good to be here and it's good to be able to travel. It's good to be able to have camp after a time of COVID. COVID was difficult. And for some of you who are introverts, you loved COVID. You loved it. You're like, stay at home. Great. Nobody can come over. That's like my cup of tea. That sounds wonderful. You enjoyed it in some ways. Others of us, like me, who thrive off of interaction and people and are extroverted, we really struggle. So some of you loved it being physically isolated. Some of you struggled with it being physically isolated. But I believe this. I believe as a church, as the body of Christ here in Sydney and for us too in Canada, we all struggled being spiritually isolated, didn't we? I learned great lessons about the danger of spiritual isolation because here's the truth. The Christian life was not meant to be lived on your own. The Christian life is a life that's be meant to live within the community of the family of God within the local church. That's what God calls us to do. He does not call us to live for Christ on our own. And today, what I want to do is to take a look at this passage in the Bible and see what the Bible says about our relationships and responsibilities as members of a spiritual family. We are called to be a spiritual family one to another, and that comes with a certain level of relationship, and it also comes with a certain deal of responsibility. And I'd like to look at that this morning together. So let's pray, and we'll begin our service this morning. Father, we're so thankful for the time we've had already in your house. Thank you that we can come and worship you at your throne. Thank you that you are an almighty God who's worthy of our worship. Lord, now as we open up your word, I pray that your spirit would speak to our hearts. Lord, we. We don't want to waste our time this morning. We know that your word has great power to change our hearts and our lives, and we ask that you do a great work. Help us, as we just sang a moment ago, to be honest and willing to say, here am I, Lord. Whatever decision, whatever you speak to us about, Lord, would we, would we be willing to respond? And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Just prior to Jesus' ascension back to heaven, his death, his resurrection, and then his ascension, he gives uh, the disciples a famous mission, or what we would call the Great Commission. Matthew records it for us in chapter 28. I'll read it for you in verse number 18. The Bible says this, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Christ gave his disciples and really gave the local church the great commission. It is the mission which we are to carry out as his believers, as his followers here on earth. It involves certain things. We're to go. 
We're to win people to Christ, we're to baptize, and we're to teach, but really the underlying, underlying theme of the Great Commission is really found in that word teach. The word teach is also translated there in Scripture, in other parts of Scripture, as disciple. Here's what we are called to do as Jesus' followers. We are called to be his disciples, and we are called to make disciples. We as a church, you as a church here in Sydney, have a responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission, to follow after Christ yourself, and to go after others to help them follow after Jesus as well. This is your mission. I found this on your website. At Faith Baptist Church in Sydney, our mission is to go forth with a message of hope to fulfill Christ's great commission. That's what your website says about your church. That's why you exist, to fulfill Christ's great commission. And you know, I want to say this as we begin this morning. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, the very first step in discipleship is understanding that Jesus loved you enough to, to come and to live a sinless life and to, to give his life as a sacrifice on the cross to pay the penalty for your sin. And today, there's no better decision you could make than to put your faith in Jesus Christ and, and make him Lord of your life. But you know, we have a, a mission to fulfill, and the mission is to make disciples. Discipleship is a word that we use very often here in church, but sometimes I think we don't understand all of what it means when the Bible uses the word discipleship. Now, I know here at Faith Baptist, you use a, a program of discipleship, continue. Uh, you go through a maybe 12 or 14 week program and a course of what it means to be a disciple. You learn how to get grounded in your faith and you understand Bible, basic Bible doctrines and you understand how to read your Bible and share your faith with others. And if you haven't done that, I encourage you to do that. That's a great thing. We were encouraging the teens at Epic Camp to get plugged in and to go through the continue program. However, here's the problem with treating and looking at discipleship that way. We can look at discipleship as a 14-week commitment. And once we've checked the box, we've completed the course, we've got our certificate, then the process of discipleship is finished. I'm done. I'm a disciple. I got the ticket to prove it. However, discipleship is a lifelong journey. Discipleship is a, is a mission, a challenge that's given to each and every single one of us today. And I want you to see this this morning, as we get to our text, that the mission of the church, discipleship, will never be fulfilled without purposeful relationships. Purposeful relationships. In order to teach and disciple others the way we are commanded to do, we must have purposeful relationships with one another. Let me say it a more simple way. Nobody was discipled by accident. Nobody. If you're going to make disciples here in Sydney, it's going to be because you choose to do it on purpose. And my challenge to you today is just very simply, we're going to look at the examples of Scripture and learn how we can on purpose leave this place with a challenge and a fire to go out and to make disciples here in Sydney. I want you to consider these biblical examples of discipleship. Remember in the Old Testament with me, Moses and Joshua. Moses and Joshua. Here's what the Bible says in Exodus 33. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend, and he turned again into the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not of the tabernacle. Here we see Moses, the old man, the leader, and we see the young man Joshua serving him, sitting with him, building this relationship from a very young age. We see Moses and Joshua. Now think about the example of Eli, the priest, and young Samuel. The Bible says in 1 Samuel, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. What a beautiful Old Testament example of mentorship, of discipleship. You had the old priest and the young Samuel. Now what about Jesus, the greatest example in Mark chapter 3? And he ordained 12 that they should be with him and that he might send them forth to preach. He ordained his 12 disciples. And now probably the greatest outside of Jesus example we see of discipleship and mentorship in the New Testament is the guy we're going to look at today, Paul and young Timothy. 1 Timothy 1, the Bible says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope, unto Timothy, mine own son in the faith. He says, young Timothy is like a son to me. I'm like a spiritual father to young Timothy. 
So we can see from the Old Testament, Eli and Samuel and Moses and Joshua, the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples and Paul and Timothy, that we have a responsibility to mentor others and to disciple others as we collectively try to follow after Jesus. And so, with all of that in mind, let's look at our passage now in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, and let's look at the words of Paul the Apostle to the church here at Thessalonica. The Bible says this, For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our ex exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail for our laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses in God also how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that she would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. The book of 1 Thessalonians was written by Paul to a group of believers who he knows personally. He has a relationship with them. Uh, the, the, the believers here who he's writing to are fairly new Christians. They've been saved under Paul's preaching and teaching ministry. If you want, this week, go back and take your Bibles and look at Acts chapter 17 and read the story. We won't do it this morning, but read the story of how God began the church here in Thessalonica. Paul begins to go into the synagogue, and he goes uh, three days, Sabbath days in a row, and begins to preach and teach. And these uh, believers, or people begin to come to Christ and trust Christ, and young uh, Christians begin to get saved and grow in their faith. And he's preaching and teaching. The problem is, is they live in a very, very wicked culture. And the king and the government and the world around them doesn't like the fact that they're no longer uh, putting the government as number one in their life, but now they're actually putting Jesus as Lord of their life. And they aren't too happy about this. And so Paul and these new believers fall under great persecution. And Paul is trying to disciple these young believers, but he comes under such great persecution that he's actually forced to flee. And he forsakes and kind of abandons this young church, these young believers. And, and later he sends Timothy back to check on them. And Timothy comes and gives them a report of how they were doing. This letter is Paul's answer back to the church. He's like, hey, I heard from Timothy. He told me the update of how you're doing, and I'm responding to you with this letter. The first three chapters, Paul is reminding the Thessalonians about their time together. He's re remembering how, how he was there and preaching to them and teaching to them. One of the things that's so important to know, and we'll see this throughout our message this morning, is that one of the things that was going on in the wicked culture of the day is that many people would claim the name or the title of spiritual teacher or leader or authority, but they were actually using that for personal gain. In the wicked culture of the day, there were those who said, hey, I'm a preacher, I'm a teacher, I'm a spiritual leader, I'm a rabbi, follow me. But they would use that platform to take advantage of others, physically sometimes, financially. And Paul, at the beginning of our, our chapter here, he's reminding them, he's saying, hey, that's not the kind of relationship we had when I was there. That's not the kind of pastor, preacher, teacher I was. I wasn't the kind that said, hey, I love you, and I'm trying to help you, but really wanted to take advantage of you. That's not who I was. And we see that in verses 3 to 6. And we get to verse number 7, and this is kind of the key of our text this morning. Paul uses two relationships, pictures of imagery, two family relationships to try to help these believers understand the relationship between a spiritual leader and a church. He says, hey, I tried to help you. I tried to disciple you. And this is who I was. I wasn't someone who took advantage of you. I wasn't a hypocrite. 
I wasn't a liar. This is the kind of leader and teacher I was when I was with you. And I want to learn from these two relationships this morning. The first one, I want you to look at verse number seven with me. I want us to see the example of a caring mother. The example of a caring mother. Look at verse number seven again with me. The Bible says this in verse seven. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Paul says, hey, when I was there with you as your pastor, as your preacher, as your teacher, he said, I I didn't take advantage of you. I wasn't harsh. I wasn't abusing you. I was like a gentle mother. Paul says, you got to learn the example of the caring mother. This is a picture of a mother feeding and and nursing her own children. I'm 26 years old. I don't have any children. I'm the perfect person to talk about this, right? I know all what it's like for a mom to feed. No, I, I really don't. But this is what Paul says. He says, hey, when I was with you, when I was among you, I was like a mom nursing and cherishing her own children. A gentle, loving, spiritual leader. It's a beautiful picture of what it should look like for us to lead and disciple one another. Verse number eight, Paul says this. He says, I I love this. He said, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because you were dear unto us. Paul said, this is the kind of teacher I was. I didn't just give you the good news. I didn't just give you the gospel. I gave you my very life because I loved you. You were dear unto me. Paul wasn't the kind of mother who serves up dinner and says, hey, come and get it. He says, no, I gave you the food and I gave you my my very life because I loved you and I was dear unto you. And he's teaching us an example that if we are to invest our lives into one another and to make disciples, it's going to take more than just the right words. It's going to take an investment of our lives the way a mother sacrifices her life for her children. Look at verse 9. He says, you remember, brethren, our labor and travail for laboring night and day. We would not because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, but we preach unto you the gospel of God. Paul is saying, hey, we weren't like those other preachers and teachers. We didn't take advantage of you uh, financially. In fact, we worked to support ourselves and so that we could on the side preach and teach the gospel to you. We didn't take advantage of you financially at all. We worked day and night so that we could give of ourselves and give the gospel to you. This is a great reminder for us that the work of the ministry is not just for pastors. Beware of the mindset that you can't serve the Lord because you're not getting a paycheck for it. Paul says we worked day and night so that we could give you the gospel. The Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 4 that the pastor's role is to equip you for the work of the ministry is to help to equip you so that you can serve the Lord and you can edify and build one another up. Paul says, hey, we served day and night. We gave of ourselves the way a mother gives of herself for her children. No doubt there's many mothers in the room this morning. And they could tell you far better than I could tell you what it takes to be a mom. The physical and emotional and and spiritual and mental toll of being a mom. Man, the sacrifice. Many mothers give up their time. They give up their careers. They give up their own physical bodies because they love their children and they want the best for them. A mother gives up their sleep, wakes up all hours of the night. No doubt some of you who are in that early stage of parenting know what it's like to be woken up at every hour of the, of the night to feed and to care for your, your, your child. They give up their time. You know, we're here visiting Jeremy and Jackie. Lots have changed since the last time we've been here. Last time we were here, Jeremy and Jackie weren't even engaged. Now they're married and they have a baby. It's awesome to see them in that new stage of life together. Jeremy and Jackie, we love you, but we're just here to visit Isla. <laughs> I'm sure Pastor Mansour agrees. Jeremy's great, but Isla's way better. She's beautiful. And you know what? We're going to spend some time with them this week, and I guarantee you, We will change our schedule. We will rotate and adjust everything around Isla. She will be the center of our affection. We will plan our hangout time around her naps. I promise you we will. Because your whole life changes when you've given yourself for your child. Your schedule changes. Your body changes. Your life changes. You're willing to give up everything for the good and the growth of your child. So here comes the question for us today, church. 
Who are we investing our lives into spiritually in the level that Paul says here as a mother for their children? Who are you discipling with the kind of effort that you're willing to give up everything, not just the gospel, but your own life also, because you love them and you want them to grow closer to Jesus? Who is it that, you, that knows they can call you in the middle of the night if they need you? Who's you're willing to give up your life and your schedule, everything, just so that they would know and follow after Jesus? Paul says, we were like a caring mother among you. So many times we want ministry, the work of the ministry or discipleship to fit into our schedule. We'll do it when it's most convenient, when I have a free night, when I'm, when I'm not working, when I'm not busy with the family. And I understand there's a balance there. But imagine a mother who feeds and cares for her children only when it fits best into her schedule. Only when she has enough time and she can squeeze. We, we, we would call that abuse. We would call that neglect. Yet spiritually speaking, I wonder how many in our church and our community are neglected because it doesn't fit into our schedule. Paul says, the kind of spiritual leader I was, the way I discipled you was the way a mom gives everything for her children. We need to learn the example of a caring mother. But secondly, this morning, we need to learn the example of a coaching father, a caring mother and a coaching father. The roles of mothers and fathers are a little bit different, aren't they? They're both parents, but they're different. Look at verse number 10 with me. The Bible says this, ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. And you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. I love the words that Paul uses there in verse number 11. He says, we exhorted and comforted and charged you. Now, I'm encouraging you today to be a coaching father because I think there's a lot of similarities between the role of a coach and the role of a father. An exhorter, a comforter, and a challenger. In fact, uh, I actually, maybe some of you will like this. I, at Epic Camp, I watched my first ever NRL rugby game. My first ever one. I watched the grand final. And I watched Penrith just destroy. How many, anyone Penrith fan? One, one. He was like, now, I didn't really care who won the game, but here's something I thought was interesting. Both of the coaches had sons who played on their team. One of the most, uh, to me, touching moments of the whole evening was watching uh, Nathan Cleary hung, hug his dad, the coach, after the game. That struck me because so many dads, fathers grow up coaching their sons, don't they? Perhaps watching them play rugby and coaching them at a little young age and watching them grow up. There's a beautiful picture and, and, and such similarities between the role of a coach and the role of a father. Paul says, I exhorted, I challenged you, I comforted you, I charged you. It's like a coach on the sidelines who's cheering them on before the game in the locker room. He's giving them that pregame speech. He's like, hey, guys, you can do it. We can win. Man, when they're struggling, when they're giving it their all and they're not winning, he wraps his arm around them and comforts them. Hey, you played a great game. It wasn't the outcome we wanted. Maybe we didn't win the game, but, but, but I love you. And, and you, you did great. I'm comforting. Exhorting them. Hey, you got to do it this way. That's not the way we're going to win. Remember the fundamentals. Remember what I taught you. You need to fix this and change this. It's the role of a coach. And we have something so much more important than a grand final, so much more important than sports. Paul's like, I was a father among you, not so that you could win a rugby game, but look at verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Our calling in life is so much more than the calling of this world. We have a, a calling and a purpose on our life to li live worthy of the glory of God. And we need a church family of fathers to step up and say, hey, let me encourage you when you need it. Let me challenge you when you need it. Let me correct you when you need it. The role of a coaching father. You know what's interesting? And I want to say this before we keep going. Paul calls himself a mother and a father. Be careful of saying, oh, we need some spiritual mothers. All right, ladies, step up. No, Paul called himself a a spiritual mother, and a spiritual father. 
We all have a responsibility to love and nurture and care for others and give of ourselves for others, and yet also to encourage and comfort and exhort one another. Yet here's, the th I think, sometimes why we don't see uh, enough coaching and encouraging uh, relationships within the church is that we don't care to know one another. Our relationships can become very surface level. How was your week? Good. How was your week? Good. Small talk, which is so often the enemy of discipleship. We don't know when someone needs encouraging. We haven't invested enough into the relationship so that when they need correcting, we're like, oh, I'm probably not the person who should say it. What will they think of me? And so we see the need, or perhaps we don't even see it. And there's people in this room who need encouragement, need comfort, and are struggling, and you don't even know. That's why we're using words that are family terms, father and mother. The church is to be a place of close relationship where we know the people who are here and we love them and we encourage them and we know when they need help and we know when they need encouragement and we know when they need correction. We need more spiritual fathers. But you know, I think there's another reason why we don't have more spiritual fathers. Sometimes we're just not worry, willing to have the hard conversation. We're not willing to sit someone down, take someone for coffee and say, hey, I see something in your life and I think you need to change it. You know, I, I want to tell you this morning that I'm very thankful for people in my life who are willing to love me enough to tell me when I'm wrong. You all need someone in your life who's willing to tell you when you're wrong. I'm thankful for a pastor and an assistant pastor in my life back home who will tell me when I'm wrong. I'm thankful for a wife who will tell me when I'm wrong and will encourage me when I need it, and will comfort me when I need it. Sometimes she plays the role of spiritual father and mother for me. We need those people in our life. You need to be that for somebody here in this church. Sometimes we're just not willing to have the hard conversations. We're not willing to give of ourselves and have the relationships. But you know another reason why sometimes we don't have enough spiritual fathers in the church? It's because spiritual fathers must lead by example. Look at verse number 10 with me one more time. The Bible says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and un unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Paul says this. He says, hey, we didn't just talk the talk, we walked the walk. He said, we encouraged you, and we challenged you, and we comforted you, but we also let our lives be an example of what it looks like to follow after Jesus. And sometimes we don't coach and encourage and help other people on their walk with God because our life is not what it ought to be. Paul says, I lived a holy life, a just life, an unblameable life. I was willing to say, hey, my actions were right. And do you notice what he said? He said, you were witnesses and God also. He said, my actions were right, but my motives were right. God is my witness. He knew my heart. I lived a just and holy life before you as an example. Remember the famous words of Paul? He says, follow me as I follow Christ. Can I ask you this morning, is your testimony within this church one that others would want to follow? Do you have the kind of life and the kind of heart before Jesus to say, hey, I want to help you. I want to encourage you to be more for Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. We need some men and women who are willing to put their lives on the stand and say, hey, we'll follow Jesus. And we'll help you to follow him too. Let my life be an example of what it looks like to follow after Jesus. So we need spiritual mothers, we need caring mothers, and we need coaching fathers. I already referenced in verse number six how Paul is talking about the abuse of spiritual leadership in the day. Remember that? How there's pastors and leaders who are uh, saying that they want the best for people, but they're actually taking advantage of people. You know, we have that same culture today, don't we? The church is marked by hypocrisy. One of the reasons why young people and younger generations are just leaving the church like in tens and hundreds is because of the hypocrisy they see among church leadership. They see people who say one thing and do another. The church is marked by scandal. People sometimes laugh. I don't know what it's like here, but back home, sometimes people just laugh at you when you say you're from a church. We'll talk to somebody and say we're from church, and they say, hey, aren't you responsible for all of these things? And, oh, you guys are just hypocrites. You know what the world needs? The world needs some spiritual leaders, some Christians who will say, hey, this is who we are, and they'll back up the truth of God's word with their lives. Not hypocrites, 
but that they'll rebuild the testimony of Jesus Christ and his church by being who God has called us to be, not just in word, but in deed also. That's what this church needs. That's what this community needs. There's some people to, to, to speak about it, but also to live it. One of my greatest joys in life, and I, I love this about your church. Everybody's uncle and everybody's auntie. I, I like that. We don't do that at our church, but maybe we'll start. I don't know. But one of my greatest joys in life, I already told you that Alom and I don't have children, but one thing we do have is we have nieces and nephews. And my favorite thing to be called in the whole world is Uncle Levi. I love being an uncle. I love it. I, I have two older sisters, or well, I have three older sisters, two of them have children. So I have five nieces and nephews on my side of the family. And then Aloma's older sister has two children as well. And so we have two over there. And the kind of uncle I like to be, maybe some of you relate to this, I like to be what I call a funkle. A funkle. A fun uncle. Funkle, right? I like to be the kind of uncle that when I show up, the party starts. We start having fun. And I love it. My niece is ne- my oldest nephew. He's about to turn 10. And we have tons of fun. I'm always teasing him. We're playing together. He loves baseball and sports. And he's so smart. And I love hanging out with him. And I've realized that the reason I love my nieces and nephews so much is this. Because I have all the joys of a relationship and none of the work. None of it. I show up, man, and we just have a blast. I don't worry about anything. I don't worry about how they're going to get fed. I don't worry about what time they go to sleep. I don't worry about their nap schedule. I don't worry about uh, giving them too much sugar too close to their bedtime. I don't worry about if the toy I bought them makes too much noise and squeaks around the house. I don't worry about any of those things. All I worry about is just having the best time I can in the time I have with my nieces and my nephews. Sometimes I'll be holding, you know, a Miller is my, my sister's baby. He's just, just over one year old. Sometimes I'll be holding him, you know, he's so cute. And all of a sudden it's like, ooh, I don't worry about that. I'm just like, hey, mom, dad, I just pass him off. That's not my responsibility. I'm just an uncle. I'm not mom or dad. I'm afraid sometimes we've taken that mentality and we've applied it to the church. We have relationships, but when the real work of discipleship begins, we're like... But the church is a place where we should have spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. But I wonder if it's a place where we have spiritual orphans who are looking for mentorship, who are looking for examples, who are looking for people to help them to follow Jesus, help them to know what it means to to have a relationship with God and how to live out this Christian life, and they're not finding anybody who will help them. We need spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. We don't need spiritual funkles. We need mothers and fathers. Are we too selfish? of our time, of our schedules, of our means to give ourselves of others. Paul says, I I gave you the gospel, but I gave my own self also. Are we too private, keeping everybody at arm's length? Just small talk. We'll never make disciples. Are we unwilling to allow our lives to be altered and changed by the investment it takes to lead other people to Jesus? The church doesn't need fun uncles and fun aunts. The church needs spiritual, caring mothers and coaching fathers. That's how you will make disciples here in Sydney. I want to finish by reading to you a verse from 2 Timothy. It's a famous verse. The Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in verse number 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. This is the pattern that God gives the church, that Paul gave to Timothy, of how the church can make disciples and continue and grow. He says, hey, the things that you learn from me, you commit those, you teach those to faithful men, and those faithful men will teach them to others. And generation after generation, the church will grow, and people will know Jesus as their Savior, and will have hope and peace, and the word will go forward because we've been faithful to pass on what's been invested to us. The question is, will we do it? Or will the cycle stop with us? Will we be the reason that there's many from the next generation who don't know Jesus, that aren't disciples, because we have uh, abdicated our responsibility to be a spiritual mother or a spiritual father? Perhaps there's somebody here today, and you've been following Jesus for a number of years, 
Perhaps you have some experience in life and, and you've, you've walked this road a little bit. You've read your Bible. Perhaps you need to find somebody in this church and say, I want to invest my life into them. It's not enough for me to just come and sit in these pews. It's not enough for me to just say hi in the lobby. I'm going to find somebody to give my life to. I'm not just going to give them the word of God. I'm going to give them my very life. I'll do what it takes to help them to follow Jesus. Maybe there's a young person in this room that says, you know what? I want to follow Jesus. Maybe you need to go to your pastor. Go to your parents and say, hey, who, who's someone I can follow? Maybe you need to find an example, a spiritual mother and father and say, hey, I want to follow you as you follow Christ. Will you mentor me? Will you help me to be more for Jesus, to be more like Jesus so that I can grow? Mothers and fathers give of themselves so their children can grow. And this church must give of, the, of yourself so that the church and the gospel will continue to grow here. Church, God gave all of us in Canada and here in Australia the great commission of making disciples. Nobody was ever discipled by accident. So today I want to challenge you to make a decision on purpose to give of yourself as a mother and as a father to make disciples and to continue the great commission of the gospel here and around the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the example of the Apostle Paul. And Lord, in the world that we live today, marked by hypocrisy and scandal, we desperately need to be people who disciple others with our word and with our deed. I pray that, Lord, that there would be some people today in this auditorium who would make a decision to invest their lives into others, no matter the cost, no matter how difficult it might be, that they might make a decision today to say, I'll do what it takes to give the gospel to the next generation. Lord, help us to learn these examples of Paul, to be caring and to coach one another, to encourage each other to live for you. We thank you so much for your word. We pray we'd help us to be doers of the word and not just hearers. In Jesus' name, amen.